Welcome to Books of Our Time, brought to you by the Massachusetts School of Law and Seeing Nationwide. Today we should discuss a book entitled Hot House, The Art of Survival and the Survival of Art at America's most celebrated publishing house, Ferrer Strauss in Giroux. The book is by Boris Kochka. It tells the story of mid and late 20th century literary New York through the lens of an extraordinary book publisher, Ferrer Strauss. The book's author, is a contributing editor at New York Magazine, and he is with me today to discuss his book. And I am Lawrence R. Valvela, Dean of the Massachusetts School of Law. Well, Boris, thank you for coming up here. Thank Appreciate you so it. much for having me. Don't think we've had anybody else named Boris, <laughs> but as we uh, were discussing before, you and I have <laughs> common Ukrainian antecedents, so. <laughs> So Boris is completely appropriate. Tell us first uh, a little bit about uh, Ferris Strauss, how it got started, uh, what kinds of reputation and how quickly it amassed the reputation that it had, uh, why it is famous, and you know other generally relevant things of that nature. It stands in a class alongside Knopf, uh, Alfred A. Knopf, and a couple of other publishing houses for um, being prestigious for being one of the few publishing houses whose names um, informed readers might recognize. Um, but the, uh, how it's different from Knopf and a couple of the others is that it um, only uh, was founded uh, after World War II, when most of these other houses had already been established, um, Knopf and Bennett Serf's uh, Random House. So what it had to do was establish a uh, reputation relatively quickly which it did. Um, it, it's a, it was a small to mid-sized house. It was independent far longer than any of the other ones, including Knopf, which was acquired by Random House, which was in turn acquired by RCA. Um, Ferris Strauss was independent until 1994, and it is responsible for the most Nobel Prize winners uh, of any publishing house, excluding, I guess, something like Penguin Random House, which now publishes maybe 40% of the books in America. But uh, it's hard to compare those two. Um, as a house that stood on its own, it's unparalleled in terms of the uh, amount of memorable literature that it, that it published. Is there any house of any type in any other artistic, or for that matter, commercial endeavor that you know of that has stood so uh, sturdily against giants? I mean, one doesn't hear about this very often. Y uh, other cultural fields, uh, or, or for that matter, commercial fields. The only parallel that I can think of is The New Yorker. It's, it's, it's easy to forget The New Yorker um, had decades of doldrums, well, as, as did Ferris Strauss. Uh, well, maybe not decades for Ferris Strauss, but um, The New Yorker also wasn't um, prestigious for its entire history. But I think... Um, I think it's similar in that it, it's, it's, it stands for a certain standard um, but a, and is culturally dominant without necessarily being financially dominant, um, which definitely Ferris Strauss was not financially dominant. This, this strikes me uh, rather powerfully because aren't I correct in thinking that uh, Roger Strauss, the founder and uh, for decades the main force he wasn't exactly what you would call a highly intellectual or highly uh, uh, cultured guy. He was kind of a, well, to put it bluntly, he was kind of a crude big mouth. Yeah, yeah. Well, one of the big questions that I wanted to explore in the book was why did he uh, not just establish a publishing house, because um, that actually was not an unusual way to go at the time for someone of his class who wanted to, you know, uh, start a business. But why did he um, why did he want to develop a literary reputation? It sort of happened a little bit by accident. But uh, you know, I talked to his son, and um, we were actually talking about a period much later when um, Roger was tilting against the corporations, and um, he um, he, he didn't want them to take over his business. Yeah, uh, and he didn't like their business model, and more importantly, he was competing for the same authors. So about Simon and Schuster, he said, well. They might as well be making spaghetti or rugs. Um, at the time, they were owned by a corporation that made gaskets and things like that. And so I said to, you know, I was talking to his son, Roger Strauss III, and I said, 
why didn't he want to make spaghetti or rugs? And he said, well, it's not that you know he had to make. I, it's not that he has a literary mind. It's that if he w if he were to make spaghetti, it wouldn't be spaghetti. It would be uh, some kind of exquisite artisanal pasta or something. It it had to be something that was different, that was special. Um, I think he had a, a feeling that he was special and. Uh, somehow he wanted to cultivate that in whatever he did. To put it uh, crudely, he was something of an egomaniac. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. He had to be at the center of attention. And, um, you know, he could have gone into film or um, any, uh, a, a ver maybe newspapers, which is actually how he kind of started out. But I think books were uh, at the center of a culture at the time yeah. and commanded a kind of respect. Um, and if you were in that world, you were in and he wanted to be in, and um, I think FSG played to that. Yeah. I was growing up in roughly those days. We started Ferrer in uh, about 45, 46. Yeah. And I learned to, I learned to read in 46, and I started with Smyrna High School in the early 50s. So that's roughly the period the period you're talking about, and uh, I will attest that. And this was pre-television. And uh, to the extent we use electronic media, uh, media. Asi aside from movies, it was radio. The <laughs> Gabriel Heater and the Lone Ranger, you know, <laughs> and, that, and, that, and that kind of stuff. Gabriel Heater's son was published by Roger Strauss. I was wondering, I saw the name, and yeah. I wondered whether uh, yeah. <laughs> there was a relationship. One of his best friends, yeah. 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 Really, you know, I will attest uh, to what a cultural uh, big deal, so to speak, uh, books were. And, uh, you know, it's really tragic that television has pretty much taken over everything in the city. So much less reading. Of course, you could argue that the people who are watching television, at least many of them, wouldn't be reading anyway, but yeah. wh who can say? Who can say? Yeah. Unusual things happen. Here's a guy who is, uh, who is a very crude guy. And I think a tough guy, apparently, apparently charming as the Dickens, apparently could charm and talk his way into or out of anything. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. He, uh, in school, he didn't do very well at school. Um, he claimed to have um, read a lot of Steinbeck. I think even at the time it was, well, you know, everybody read a lot of Steinbeck. He didn't graduate high school. That's true, by the way. Yeah. <laughs> I did. Uh -huh. Yeah. Uh, he didn't do well in school, but he told his... Um, secretary of 40 years, one of the people who knew him best, um, that the only class that he succeeded in was contemporaneous speaking, which, which was uh, basically, um, all right, five minutes to talk about chandeliers, you know. And um, he just had an innate talent for that, for, for turning it on, and, and a genuine curiosity to hear other people's stories. I mean, he reveled in gossip, and the same kind of gossip that he generated in the things that he did behind closed doors. but. Um, that that was his singular talent, and I think that, as much as um, the class he was born into, is responsible for the fact he decided to go into business uh, as opposed to uh, just writing or um, or any other field. As I was thinking about this interview, the uh, the uh, strangeness, for lack of a better word, uh, unusualness, unexpectedness of uh, what he did, considering who he had been and the way he was. Uh, struck me, and it, it also struck me that you just never know. And, and I'll give you a f the four example that came to my mind. I lived in a neighborhood in Chicago. I grew up in a neighborhood in Chicago, which was a sort of rough and ready. We weren't hoods or anything like that. But it was the first generation out of the ghetto, and all the parents and some of the students uh, were still, uh, they were not yet middle class, and uh, yet, within a 10 block radius, I think, came Joseph Epstein, Scott Turow, Ira Burko, and if you go a little farther afield, Gerald Graff. Now these are all famous American literati from this neighborhood was once in a more elegant uh, uh, group termed our crowd, uh -huh. <laughs> you know, give me a break. And yet here it was, these guys came out of there, 
and uh, has done very well as uh, authors, as journalists. So as they say, go figure. Well, I mean, if, if you want to find a real rags to riches story, I think it's Giroux, Robert Giroux, who was the first uh, of anyone he knew to go to college from Jersey City and um, got into Columbia on scholarship, worked through it, uh, had no connections in the literary world except for those he made at Columbia, including John Berryman, who became poet, uh, who was a poet at the time. You know, what Roger was doing was rebelling against the uh, people who had made it. His grandfather was the first Jewish ambassador to the United States. His grandfather was in th four or five cabinets, I think. I was reading yeah. about it this yeah. morning. Yeah, he wrote, he published a, a memoir called Under Four Administrations. I should have read up on this, but I think it was Cleveland, Taft, uh, definitely Teddy Roosevelt, who was his idol. And probably Wilson. And, uh, and Wilson, right. Yes, exactly. Of the Abraham and Strauss um, family, Macy's, and uh, on the other side, Guggenheim. <laughs> uh, his brother, he, <laughs> he used to say, he used it's to almost say a bad joke. That, uh, yeah, he used to joke that all of his grandparents died on the Titanic, <laughs> which, which, which isn't true. Only two uh, uncles on opposite sides. Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> but that's enough. Um, yeah. He was, his brother went to Princeton. His father went to Princeton. Um, By the way, for Jewish kids to go to Princeton in those days. Yeah. Whoa, this was not usual. Yeah. His father was a, a, a very assimilationist. He founded the Conference for Christians and Jews. He sent him to St. George's, which was an anti-Semitic uh, prep school. All these things bubbled up under Roger, and um, he couldn't—he he couldn't fit that mold that they wanted to fit him into. Yeah. Uh, and so he would curse, and he would speak y in, in Yiddishisms that his parents would would never have deigned to use. <laughs> I think that's why he loved Isaac Singer so much, was because uh, uh. it brought him into a kind of Jewishness that he never knew growing up. <laughs> Y you know, uh, I, I, I'm really chortling because in my family it was just the opposite. My parents used all of them and I refused to. <laughs> 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 Which, by the way, is, is not so unusual for immigrant kids. Right. Yeah, an uh, un unwillingness to adopt the customs of the old, of the old country and, uh, and the old ways. So his family, he came from a wealthy family, which of course, that helped in ways to finance the founding of Ferris Strauss, didn't it? Yeah, he got about 60000 from his parents in the end, which was an advance on his inheritance. And by the way, 60000 then would be probably like 500000 or a million today. Yeah, but it wasn't enough. He needed a little bit from others. He had a, he had a sort of a playboy friend, uh, James Van Allen, Jimmy Van Allen, um, who was quite a character um, in his own right. Um, but he was a wasp, and they, they wanted it to be Strauss and Van Allen, but the Van Allen family wouldn't have it. Uh, <laughs> Strauss was, uh, sounded a little bit too, oh, I don't know, too Jewish maybe. Yeah, right. It could have been worse. Could have <laughs> been Goldberg or Schwartz. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so he was a silent partner yeah. and mostly an absent partner. But, yeah. but, you know, put money in. And then a bunch of shareholders, some Jewish, some not. But um, uh, and, and funnily enough, that was w the fact that he had to get shareholders was a, was a limit to his powers later on. Yeah. He had to always keep them happy. He always had about 50.5% of the company. Um, but yeah, sure, couldn't have started the company. And this is why the, you know, some people have asked why I focus so much on Roger Strauss. Well, aside from the fact that he's the most colorful personality in the whole story, um, no decision could be made without him. He, he owned the company. The threw his weight around, wanted to run the place, and did run the place, as, as I read the book. He was, he headed up every editorial meeting, and uh, at one point, uh, Giroux took him aside, you know, a couple of decades into their partnership when things had curdled a little bit and said, would you mind just, uh, you know, sitting back or maybe not coming to these meetings at all? And he said, oh, sure, sure, sure. And the next week he was there, like <laughs> clockwork. Yeah. All right, what's on the agenda? <laughs> yeah, I know. That was, a f <laughs> that was really very striking, very striking when I read it. Now, now Giroux came from a, a poor family. Yeah. Jersey City. Yeah. Was the first kid from his grammar school or something to be admitted to what was it Regis High School or some that's right. well known uh, pr prominent uh, high school in New York mm -hmm. Columbia yeah. uh, editor of one of the was it the Spectator uh, Columbia Review 
Some of your reviews. Yeah, which was the literary paper. Yeah, yeah. and then uh, got into the New York publishing world. So how, how did he get in? I, I've forgotten. How did he get into the publishing he world? He actually, uh, he couldn't get in at first. He wound up at CBS um, doing these books that uh, were basically transcripts of Edward R. Murrow reporting from World War II and uh, things like that. Actually, just before World War II, because then he wound up being in World War II. Um, this is London. Reporting on the Anschluss and all that, yeah. Um, Czechoslovakian invasion. He, uh, and then somehow a publisher got wind of these books and wanted to find out who, and wanted to acquire them. And CBS wouldn't let go of the rights. He said, all right, well, instead of that, can I just have your, your uh, you know, whoever put these together? And, and Giroux was hired. And then he wound up at Harcourt Brace that way. And how about Ferrer? Where, d where did he come from and what, did, what had he done? He was from uh, Vermont. He was a Yankee, um, a wasp without much money, um, with connections but not much money. He was a scholarship kid at Yale. He met Stephen Vincent Benet. Um, they became very good friends and he rose up in the book world at an earlier era. Then he got kind of stabbed in the back by his partners at Ferrer and Reinhardt. Oh, that's terrible. D tell that story. That's just one of the worst things I've heard about World War II, except for the camps. It, it's, it's a little complicated because I think Farrah was sort of a little bit absent sometimes and got, a, got a, a very involved in his causes. And one of his causes was intervention in Europe. And um, he worked in intelligence um, uh, during World War II and stepped back from the company, uh, broke his ankle, uh, wound up convalescing in Italy. Um, when he came back, uh, he was met uh, uh, from the ship. Um, by one of the Reinhardts and said, I think we have to talk. And um, turned out that in absentia they had uh, ousted him as partner in the company. So, so, I mean, it comes down to this. Here's a guy who's over uh, near combat or in combat and who anyway got injured in World War II, and he comes back and they say, uh, and his name's the first name, and it was for, for Ferrer, Holt, and Reinhardt. And he co gets off the boat and they say, you're done. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and his, uh, his wife, who, by the way, uh, invented the crossword for Simon & Schuster, oh, yeah. uh, which kept Simon & Schuster afloat, and only to, you know, then they became, you know, Roger Strauss's rivals, but she had been an editor at the company. I mean, th this was a family firm, and so he felt really betrayed and uh, felt like his career was basically over, and uh, Roger Strauss comes waltzing in, this 28-year-old kid who doesn't know anything about literature and says, uh, how would you like to take, take another shot? Yeah. And eventually he decided, well, this is my only shot at getting back in. Yeah. And um, yeah. He, at first he told Strauss no, didn't he? And he called, but he thought better of it the next day. He called him back and said, I've, re I've rethought this. Yeah. Yeah. He yeah. said, all right, all right, let's do this. Yeah. And uh, he brought in the first, uh, the first few writers. You know, they were sort of middle brow. You know, some of them were good. Some of them, their names we don't remember anymore. Um, you know, Anthony Adverse. Have you heard of that? Huge oh bestseller. Yes. Yeah. yeah. But not many people have. Yeah. It was a famous movie, was it not? In yeah. addition to being a book? Mm hmm. Uh, you know, from the beginning, uh, Roger had wanted to bring somebody else on to do the editorial voice, someone a little bit younger, uh, a little bit fresher. And the first person he thought of was Giroux, but Giroux said no. Um, but they had met during the war, actually, uh, because Giroux had been in the Navy uh, but seen actual combat. Roger wasn't in combat. He worked uh, sort of, this, you know, media propaganda. Uh, it was the book and magazine section of the Navy's <laughs> PR division. You know, you describe it. One doesn't know whether to laugh or cry. It's so preposterous. It's worse than you know, people like Joe DiMaggio doing nothing but playing baseball in the Army. Yeah. He was sitting there in his in his Navy whites in an office in New York with his feet propped up on the desk when people walked in. Right. The, the, this is Roger Strauss's war. <laughs> okay. <laughs> in including Giroux, who comes in and outranks him. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and Roger's like, what do you got for me, baby? You know? <laughs> got a story. He was on a ship, and there was a dramatic rescue at sea. There was no war correspondent on board, and he decided he'd write the story himself. Roger sold it to Colliers for a thousand bucks. Yeah. Uh, and Which in those days was significant. Yeah. So it was a pretty good deal for both of them. Yeah. But uh, that's how they got to know each other. You, you uh, say that uh, Strauss's favorite book among all the books that FS&G published in his 45 years or so there is a book called Memoirs of Hadrian. Mm -hmm. 
So what was Memoirs of Hadrian about, and who wrote it, and why was it his favorite book? Uh, Memoirs of Hadrian was a novel by Margaret Yersinar, published in 1951, um, supposedly the deathbed confessions of um, Hadrian, the Roman emperor. It was brilliantly written. Um, I think the reason, the reason Roger said it was his favorite book, and you can't take everything he says at face value, um, was A, because it, he had to choose a favorite and it couldn't be a living author. He didn't want to offend any of his other authors. I think it was also because it was acquired before Giroux came in, so Giroux couldn't take credit for it. <laughs> that was another thing. Yeah. But I think, I, think he, I, I think the tone of it resonated with him, and um, that's why it's, uh, I quoted in the introduction of my book, um, here's this emperor who we know, reading it now, um, was one of the last um, great emperors of Rome before the fall. Real theme of the book is um, is uh, culture and civilization um, and how it declines and rises up again. And I think Roger very much saw himself this way, especially later on in his um, uh, leadership of FSG as, as, a, as a last bastion of a certain kind of literary culture and, and uh, publishing business. Uh, and I think he identified with Hadrian somehow. I mean, as we said, he was an egomaniac, so. Yeah. How much did it take to start the business, and where did he get the money? Uh, he got a lot of it from shareholders, so, and these were shareholders. How did he persuade them? I think it was that charm that we were talking about. Um, I think it was also the, yeah, it was the chance to get a piece of something. I mean, one of the people that invested was uh, one of the Fleischmanns, and, um, this guy's cousin was Raoul Fleischmann, who co-founded The New Yorker. Um, you know, Roger's cousin was Peggy Guggenheim, who um, you know, obviously was a patron of the arts. Um, patronage was a big thing. Um, and the people that he knew, the circles that his parents knew, were, uh, were patrons, were wealthy families who uh, wanted to park their money somewhere. Um, he always said, um, so he said, keep your shareholders happy, but never give them more than 3%. <laughs> That's what he did. They had to have some successful books or else they were going to go out of business. And for that, they, uh, they, they took some books that s in subsequent years, some of his great fans would look at it, look askance at it, because he took the books you had that sold a lot of copies so that they could make money and survive, you know. Mm -hmm. So anyhow, he knew he had to survive, and so he published some of the, some of the uh, books like uh, Look Younger, Live Longer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. It's kind of like a uh, do this exercise and that exercise and eat this food and that food. And yeah, Gaylord Hauser. Gaylord Hauser. Gaylord okay. Hauser. Nobody knew exactly where he came from, you know, maybe somewhere in Germany. He had a partner, uh, his boyfriend, um, Frey Brown, who did all the business stuff. Frey was the brains in the family. It was... Uh, was what uh, Roger's secretary said. But basically, uh, Gaylord Hauser was a diet guru, but they actually get, did get in trouble with the FDA for a bit. Roger needed a couple of hits. And mind you, this was before, um, before Bob Giroux was there, so it was not a literary house yet. Yeah. Um, and uh, they, got, they got pretty lucky with that one. How about with Courtroom by Nizer? You know, the Sam Leibowitz was this judge who had uh, defended the Scottsboro Boys as a lawyer, and... Um, and let me just say for the audience that in legal circles and some others, that's a very famous case because Alabama hauled about eight or ten uh, black kids off a boxcar in a train and accused them of raping two white girls who were in the same boxcar, and it was, it was all trumped up. And I guess they were sentenced to die, and uh, uh, Leibowitz uh, became their lawyer and saved their lives, and it's a very famous episode in the racial history of America, but go ahead. Yeah, yeah. On the strength of his law work, he'd, he'd become a judge. Roger said he was pretty difficult to work with, too. Um, but they had to find a writer to, um, to tell the story, and that was this uh, Quentin Reynolds. And uh, that became a big hit at the same time that Look Younger, Live Longer was around. Uh, it, was, it was a slightly more substantial book, but it also trafficked in some sensational cases, and um, you know, it was, it was a little bit lurid. That was the first time he, you know, Roger said success almost bank bankrupted him once, uh, and 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 that was when because they had two bestsellers in 1950, and then the following year they couldn't follow up, and they took a bath, <laughs> and the same thing happened to them in 1988, 
after uh, two other, they had two other simultaneous bestsellers too. Fast forward a little bit, which was Scott Turow's Presumed Innocent and Tom Wolfe's Bonfire of the Vanities. Uh, publishing was a boom and bust business, and that's something that Roger knew. Tell me, what you've got two bestsellers, and the next year you don't make uh, very much, but I, I, don't, I don't get it. Why should you be bankrupted? Didn't they put the money away? Did they increase their expenses? What is it that caused well, it? Well, bankrupting is a little, um, probably a little hyperbole, but um, you want to expand, and you think to yourself you're going to be able to do it. Um, if you find something like Courtroom, if you find a Gaylord Hauser or a Quentin Reynolds, they both published books after those. Uh, Quentin Reynolds published a, a co-wrote a memoir with uh, Willie Sutton, the famous thief, and that sold almost nothing. And Gaylord Hauser never had a, a serious success after that book. So you then plow that into another huge advance, and then you print 100,000 copies and you sell 10 of them, 10,000 okay. of them. So he's spending the money and... And you buy a company because you want to you know, uh, yeah. get their backlist, and yeah. then you don't, and you know, yeah. 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 You know, you might explain, because it's so uh, much a part of the business, the impact of getting an editor who brings with him various writers and the impact of backlist. Yeah. To explain the editor thing, well, editors are not supposed to poach their writers because writers have deals with publishing houses that that's who they deal with but um, when um, an editor is the greatest advocate and uh, and the closest friend to the writer um, the writer is going to do everything they can to stick with them and this was especially true in those days it's less true now because now the writer's closest friend tends to be the agent um, but at the time that Drew left Harcourt um, he left after his, uh, his mentor, um, Harcourt, um, retired and was replaced by Bruce Zivanovich, who had come up in, um, uh, who had come up in uh, textbooks. And it became basically a textbook company. And he tried to acquire, uh, he made a handshake deal for Catcher in the Rye. Then he brought it up to his boss and he sent it over to the textbook division. And he said, uh, this isn't a children's book. Well, of course it's not a children's book. It's Catcher in the Rye. But they turned it down. Four years later, he said, I can't take this anymore. You know, they don't treat my writers well. Um, and uh, he left. Um, T.S. Eliot was um, one of his first writers that he really had a friendship with. And he was the first one to say, I've, I've got to leave. After he left, it became a lot easier for other writers to leave. Um, so he got Robert Lowell. Uh, he got um, Gene Stafford. Um, he got Flannery O'Connor, and uh, then right around that time, he started picking up some others who he'd missed, including his very close friend, John Berryman, uh, and Elizabeth Bishop came over. She was a close friend of Lowell's, and the circle started to coalesce around him, and suddenly FSG was a literary publishing house. The opposite happened when Henry Robbins left in 1972. Now, who was Henry Robbins? Henry Robbins was the editor brought in essentially to uh, succeed Robert De Niro. Um, every editor has maybe 10 or 15 years when they're really at the top of their game. They're following the literary world very closely. Um, I mean, some editors continue to acquire great work for decades, but you know, you have your core of writers and you stick with them. Um, somebody had to do that. Henry Robbins came in. Um, from Dial Press and much longer uh, years at Knopf, and he was clued into new journalism. Tom Wolfe, Joan Didion, uh, some other people like Wilfred Sheed, um, these are people he cultivated and uh, picked up uh, in the 60s for Farrah Strauss. He became, he was a fierce protector of his authors. Um, Roger would have to tell him to calm down. Um, this is Roger, who knew how to have a fight would tell him to stop sending angry letters to critics, that the critics have the right to their own opinions about his book. Um, Roger is himself a very intemperate guy. Yes. So he was a hothead, as Lynn Nesbitt, who's an agent um, who worked very closely with Henry Robbins, said he was a hothead, but he was a hothead for the right reasons. Those reasons were his authors. Joan Didion um, had an essay collection titled uh, After Henry, um, and the Henry was Henry Robbins. Um, he was the editor she insisted on working with. Um, so Henry basically, in 1973, took over as editor-in-chief. 
uh, and nine months later left for more money at Simon and Schuster, and this was to Roger um, the ultimate betrayal. And um, the Times published a story saying, well, perhaps Mr. Robbins will bring along Tom Wolfe and Joan Didion and Wilfred Sheed and Walker Percy. And when Roger saw that, he hit the roof and he assumed that Henry had told them that he was gonna bring all these authors. Maybe Henry wanted to, maybe he didn't, but it wouldn't be any different from what Bob Giroux had done 30 years before. Uh, but Roger set about a scorched earth campaign and kept every single author except Joan Didion and her husband, John Gregory Dunn. What did a scorched earth campaign consist of? Basically going around town and forbidding writers to let go of their contracts, which at some point you've got to let go because you don't want to work with a writer who doesn't want to work with you. You don't want to assign them a random editor who they don't like. Um, but Roger said, no, Henry is going around town saying that we're ready to let go of our writers in a fire sale because he has the four year, which in fact they had had a four year. Um, Henry Robbins passed away in 1979. I couldn't ask him myself, but everyone who knew him said it was preposterous that he had never spread these rumors. But um, it, so it seems that Roger implied that he had spread rumors, but in fact was himself spreading rumors about Henry's nefarious doings in order to prevent any of his authors from leaving. Uh, Strauss, when he wanted to, <laughs> was uh, pretty secretive, him uh, secretive himself because, among other things, apparently this guy conducted nonstop affairs. And he, he, <laughs> he even used the apartments of some of his employees. It was like, Remember the movie with, uh, I think it was Fred McMurray and Shirley MacLaine and Jack Levin? The uh, Apartment? The Apartment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I read that and said, my God, it's just, like, it's just like they took the movie right out of that. Except imagine if Jack Lemmon, instead of being the nice guy who lends out his apartment, is the mistress of one of these guys who are using the apartment. Because it was the mistresses who would lend out their apartments for him to use with other mistresses. Sta staggering. I mean, that's <laughs> really absolutely staggering. Well, as one person said, it was the 70s, um, although it started in the 50s. Hey, I was alive in the 70s. <laughs> Roger had a separate phone line in his office, and it was for his contacts with the CIA, because, in fact, he had two scouts who, um, who were using the scouting job as cover for their work for the CIA. In fact, they were very valuable scouts, and it's probably their CIA work that was uh, you know, not so fruitful. Um, but that telephone, once it was decommissioned, I guess you'd say, because uh, it fell out of contact with the CIA, was used for assignations. So. <laughs> For 25 years, the Massachusetts School of Law has been training great lawyers and building great relationships. Joining MSL was more than just making friends, it was becoming a part of a family, which makes it very difficult to leave. I don't want to leave MSL. We didn't want to leave MSL ever! Best decision ever! We love MSL, we don't want to leave. The Massachusetts School of Law. Great lawyers, better people. Come join our family. Visit us today at mslaw.edu. Explain what the Christ stop at Everly was. Right. I think that's, I can't believe part of the story that Christianity had never penetrated to this part of Italy, but anyway, explain it. It was Carlo Levi's book. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was set among these peasants who were uh, supposedly these sort of original pagans. Um, but um, let they me. They were still pagan. Yeah. Still. Right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I guess it what its importance for FSG was that it was really the first literary book that Roger acquired. And actually, it's funny I just mentioned the CIA because it was one of these scouts that had gotten him in touch with Carlo Levy. Carlo Levy, um, who was a communist, um, so it's possible the scout was actually reporting on Levy's communist activities even as he was getting him a book deal. But um, uh, Roger couldn't get these literary authors before Giroux came in. He had a boozy lunch with these two agents, uh, Russell and Volkening, um, and after five martinis, they said, well, why should we give you our writers when we can go to Knopf? And, uh, you know, he thought, well, I've got to do something else. I've got to go somewhere else to get my books, and they were cheaper in Europe, 
apparently the European writers hadn't been, quote, mined yet by the American houses. Yeah. The Knopfs were doing pretty well at it, but they didn't get everyone. And so there were these pockets that weren't really discovered, and one of them was post-war Italian literature. So he got Levy, he got Mar uh, Alberto Moravia, uh, he got several others. I think he missed the, the lepers, but everything else he pretty much got. It was really this moment in Italian literature. Uh, some of those books were adapted by Fellini. Um, and, uh, and then he w eventually went to the Frankfurt Book Fair and became the guy who was interested in European lit. As described in your book, he essentially was Mr. Frankfurt Book Fair. Yeah. And he originally hadn't even wanted to go. It was his secretary who dra finally dragged him and said, you've got to go to this, or somebody did. Well, it was Inga Feltrinelli, um, who uh, was a prominent Italian publisher. He, she's one of these people he would wine and dine in New York. And she said, it's ridiculous. Why are you not going? And this was by, by now, it was the early mid-60s, and Frankfurt was the place to go. And he said, well, you know, half my family was killed in the Holocaust, which wasn't true, uh, just like half of them didn't die in the Titanic. But, um, <laughs> you know, he didn't like Germany. I mean, a lot of Jews didn't like Germany. But eventually he overcame it, and um, they had this introductory lunch, and uh, they loved him. I mean, y you know, if you think of someone who is at the same time brash and aristocratic and high-handed and crass, I mean, this is something, he, he was at the same time a, s a sort of a parody of the uh, crazy American and someone who speaks their language, the language of culture, the language of class, and because they were all from wealthy families as well. Um, by now, publishing was still, m was more of a gentleman's profession in Europe than it was in the U.S. And so Roger being a throwback actually made him relate much more easily to these European publishers. And um, he got a lot of the books that way. What was his relationship with uh, Susan Sontag? They had a similar sort of uh, charisma and egocentricity, and um, you know he didn't find her. It was one of his editors that found her, and and liked her first novel, The Benefactor, enough to publish it. But uh, she was interested in in rising through. Um, parties and getting to know the intellectuals in New York and Roger was very good at squaring her around and she was beautiful and she was opinionated um, and she had style and they made a they made a wonderful pair of walking around and going to lunch together and um, uh, possibly uh, possibly um, having uh, you know private relations as well yeah, well they might have had an affair and they had a bond she became very influential. Uh, I, you know, I don't think they would have gotten Joseph Brodsky if not for her. Yeah. Uh, and yeah. through him, a lot of other European yeah. poets later on. What was the relationship between, I guess it was Giroux and uh, Kerouac? You know, he's got this hysterical story about Kerouac coming in and throwing a roll of toilet paper at Giroux and says, there it is, and this was on the road, I guess. Yeah. Which I have never been able to read. I tried. Well, I have a sneaking suspicion that Giroud didn't like it much either. But the story that he told, Kerouac comes in after some kind of binge that he doesn't know about. You know, Giroud basically said, um, we didn't use the word stoned in, in our day. I didn't know what that was. But I thought maybe he was drunk or something, sort of implying that he must have been on something, which he probably was. But he comes in with this scroll. That's what he's from right up here within 15 miles of here, Lowell. Lowell, yeah, yeah. yeah. They were by then close, um, based partly on the fact that they were both uh, these uh, Catholics that had grown up in working class environments. Um, Giroux actually was descended from uh, Canadian Catholics, as, as was uh, Kerouac. In those days, in the New York publishing world, it was a big deal. Yeah. I mean, you had your, apparently your Catholic houses, you had Jewish houses. There's a famous uh, quotation about the New York Times being uh, owned by Jews and uh, edited uh, by uh, Catholics to be read by Protestants. <laughs> 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 and, you know, there was a lot of that. That's not far off. That's a pretty, you know. Um, FSG was owned by a Jew and edited by Catholics. There were, uh, at various points, two Catholics in the partnership, one Catholic and one Protestant in the partnership, and a, a Jew. And um, all of those religions were part of the house, even though you would class it as a Jewish house. Uh, there were Jewish houses. There was, uh, there was Knopf and there was Random House, and then there were the Protestant houses, Doubleday, etc. 
FSG was keyed in, it had, had a Catholic line, had a Jewish line, even, even s tried publishing Protestant books, but that didn't go so well. It did a lot at the time of uh, John the 23rd, didn't it? What, what was it, the Vatican, Vatican II, is that what they called that, around 1961 or something like that? Yeah, which is when they absolved the Jews of uh, the charge of killing Jesus. Regicide, is that what they call that? Uh, or deicide, even worse, right? How do you, I don't know how you kill God, but anyway, that was the whole idea. So Abraham Joshua Heschel, this, uh, this rabbi and, and close friend of Rogers, they would go and have Seder at his house every year um, for Passover, um, was one of the thinkers that Roger published. And um, he actually convinced Roger to rush him to print a, a book um, describing the machinations at Vatican II with the goal of putting pressure on the Pope to uh, to move things along and absolve the Jews, um, you know whether whether it actually had any influence, I'm not sure, but it sort of shows you how enmeshed FSG was in these these different outsider groups sort of working together. Um, and the fact is that you know Jews and Catholics had something in common, which is they were not part of mainline Protestantism, not part of mainstream America um, until later. Um, I think it was. Was it Alfred Kazin or somebody else who called them semi-outsiders? Um, when you think of the partisan review and then the fact that Lowell was a Catholic, and O'Connor obviously was a Catholic, That'd knew each Flannery other. Flannery O'Connor. Yes, That'd Flannery O'Connor, yeah. yes. These were all people who um, coalesced around the idea that they were sort of on the edges of mainstream society. And that's where the intellectual energy was in the 50s and 60s. And FSG was absolutely keyed into all of that. You know, to somebody my age, the idea of these uh, religious divisions resonates because it was a very prevalent thing in those days. Uh, John Kennedy had to combat and overcome that because one of the major uh, questions raised about uh, Kennedy was Protestant groups were saying that he would take his orders from the Pope, quote unquote. Mm -hmm. and he had to make it clear that as far as he was concerned, religion was one thing and uh, the national interest of the United States was something else again. Yeah. So uh, that's as late as 1959, 60, 61. Yeah. That uh, this was still a big, uh, a big uh, split in American society. And so it was about religion, but it was also tied up with class. I mean, Catholics were considered arrival, you know, new arrivals, yeah. Irish, Italian, same as Jews. Yeah. Back in the day, I used to uh, write briefs and was pretty friendly with Bob Bork. And people always regard that as beyond comprehension because Bob was so conservative and I, I'm far from it. And uh, Bob, uh, Bob used to say that uh, the Attorney General, when he was the Solicitor General, was a guy named Edward Levi. And uh, Levi felt that the, that the um, quality of the lawyering in the Department of Justice had declined. So he told Bob to investigate why this is. So this had to be around 72, 73, something like that. And he came back and he said, here's the reason. The law firms now take Catholics and Jews. <laughs> <laughs> and he was absolutely serious about that. <laughs> and he was not himself either one. He was uh -huh. Protestant. Uh -huh. uh, Levi, of course, was Jewish. Uh, I was in the Department of Justice in 63. And uh, believe me, there were a lot of terrific lawyers there, Catholic and Jewish. And so. Well, look at the Supreme Court now. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Were we talking about the scroll? Did you want to go back to that? Go Kerouac? ahead. Kerouac? Like, Kerouac was, saw Giroux as his sort of ticket into the establishment. You know, he would take him to the opera and play. Giroux would take him to the opera. And then, and then Giroux would go and visit Kerouac in Denver and go hitchhiking with him which w to Giroux was, uh, was just, you know, completely wilding out, basically. Uh, but Kerouac comes in with the scroll, which is supposed to be his second novel. The roll of toilet paper. Yeah, well, it was a tel tel telex or whatever. It was, okay. uh, oh, it okay. was uh, yeah, yeah, it, it was, uh, it was the, the scroll, you know, okay. The okay. that he sure. scribbled on um, okay. that is now in a museum somewhere. And he threw it a a across his desk and said, uh, here it is. Here's my novel. And the first thing Giroux said was, "Well, we're going to have to. Uh, this is. Gr it's great that you, you know, finished it, but we're going to have to cut it down into pages so we can actually edit it." And Kerouac apparently said, um, "No, you're not. You're not touching this. This was dictated by the Holy Ghost." Grabbed it and ran out. 
And Jeru said he never heard from them until 10 years later. Um, actually, it's a little bit more complicated. There are letters between Jeru and, uh, I'm sorry, between Kerouac and other people explaining that Jeru doesn't want it. Uh, he thinks it's great. He thinks it's the next Dostoevsky, but his bosses will never go for it. Um, Jeru actually had the opportunity to get it later. He refused. Uh, my suspicion is that Jeru wasn't really that hot on it. And this is the story that may, probably was true, but it wasn't the end of the story. That actually there was uh, a real, that, that Giroux didn't want to go there. That he probably would agree with you, that he couldn't get through it, <laughs> basically. Um, but also uh, his bosses probably uh, resisted it as well. Uh, what was the role uh, in FSG of uh, Roger Strauss's wife, Dorothy? She was um, as important to charming the writers as Roger was because she could actually talk to them about what they were writing, which Roger, she was much more an intellectual than Roger was. Because I think these are all related. Their country home called Saraska, which stands for Sarah and Oscar, which were his grandparents, and their mansion in uh, the city itself. They uh, became FSG's sort of social outreach society. Um, it's where they had all the publication parties. It's where everybody met each other. Um, it was, it was, it was where Roger did his talking up of various books. Um, it's where he introduced all the players that were. It's where he met Philip Roth twenty years before he published him. Um, but most of the friends were Dorothea's. The people that they actually had at dinner were people like Charles Jackson and uh, Jerzy Kaczynski, people who weren't published by FSG but were friends of Dorothea's. Here's a preposterous comparison, but it reminds me of a story I just read recently about Nick Saban, the Alabama football coach, mm -hmm. who was one of the two most successful, along with Urban Meyer, two most successful football coaches in college today. His wife plays a great, uh, according to the story, his wife plays a great role in his success. She's always there. She's always doing this, that, the other, and three. Boy, you just can't overlook how, how helpful or, conversely, in many cases, unhelpful somebody's wife can be. And I guess as the world moves on, it's going to be in reverse, too, how helpful or unhelpful the husband can be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Roger was old-fashioned that way. He didn't give her enough credit for yeah. what she did. Yeah. She did a so lot. You just can't get around the fact that these kinds of things are important in life. You know, Money is a lot, but it's not the whole deal. As evidenced by the fact, I guess, that a lot of uh, authors uh, went uh, went with or stayed with uh, uh, Ferrer, Ferrer Strauss, even though they got less money from uh, Roger yeah. than they could get elsewhere. He got what um, what Susan Sontag's son calls the Roger Strauss discount, um, which is that um, you you yeah there's a there's a pay cut that you take to work uh, to to work with the editors at FSG. It's about the care that's put into the books. Um, it's about the fact that they'll publish everything um, if they trust you. They everything you write. Yeah. John McPhee published uh, 17 books, no, 14 books before he had a bestseller, which was coming into the country. Uh, every word that he wrote was published in The New Yorker, and every word that he wrote was published in FSG, at F by FSG. Um, and why did they do that? Why did they publish every word? Yeah. He was their writer. They thought his writing was brilliant. They were going to find a way to publish everything that he wrote. I mean, if he published an awful, if he wrote an awful book, I'm sure that they would try to talk him out of it. Yeah. But John McPhee and these other writers, the, the core of the writers there, um, commanded absolute loyalty from Roger. At least in terms of their writing, uh, they didn't get much pay. Um, as Especially going to the 70s and 80s, you know, you talk to people like Jamaica Kincaid and Ian Fraser, and they would say it was a club that you wanted to be in. It was like working for George Balanchine. You didn't question it. You wanted to be part of it. And um, Scott Turow took $200,000 from them, and he was being offered 350 from someone else. Uh, but he'd grown up reading FSG books. Um, he was a thriller writer who wanted to be considered literary. I mean, where else would you go for And he was making a ton of money as a lawyer besides. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> sure. But he did eventually leave for more money, many years yeah. later. Yeah. What was their relationship with Solzhenitsyn? That's one of those real nail biters where they, uh, Roger wound up bidding 400000 for it, and I think um, 
the next bidder bid 600,000. So he got it for two thirds of the price that was being offered. Um, there were a couple things that they did to get Solzhenitsyn. Um, one of them was that, so Solzhenitsyn was a dissident who was in essentially I internal sort of provisional exile. He was not allowed to publish in the Soviet Union and anything that was published in the US he had to disavow because it was illegal. So in the Soviet Union, people were reading what I think were called Sami's dots, where yeah. un underground manuscript. Yeah. yeah. Anything that was published here had to be smuggled out. So you were dealing with smugglers. There was no copyright agreement between the Soviet Union and the US. Um, and what Roger did was he, pr he actually provided royalties, which he didn't have to because uh, it wasn't a legal publication. He continued with the publication of uh, the first circle, I think, which was what, uh, no, the Cancer Ward, sorry. First circle was a Harper and Rowe. Uh, even he should have canceled it because the Dial Press had beat him to it. And so his sales were going to suffer. The Dial Press was publishing a bootleg edition, but Roger went ahead with it uh, because he wanted to stay in good faith with Solzhenitsyn. Had, this had he entered later. a contract with him? Uh, there was a contract, but um, all the contracts were then challenged when Solzhenitsyn finally lawyered up. Um, and uh, anyway, lots of complicated moves up leading up to the acquisition of August 1914, but the way that Roger uh, managed to secure that, and that was a year, a year after Solzhenitsyn won the um, Nobel Prize, was that he went to Frankfurt, which he had been working for 10 years now, seven years now. None of the other bidders actually went. He went, he met with the publisher uh, of Solzhenitsyn in German, and um, he got the rights. He said, what can I do for you? I can't afford more than $400,000, but he gave a percentage here, a percentage there, and he talked it out. And that was the only way they managed to get it. Um, and when the story finally came out in the Times about the fact that they had undercut, they, they had undercut all these other publishers, uh, Roger said um, that it's still possible in this day and age, it's 1972, uh, to prove that uh, personal relationships can win out over cabled bids of money. Zolzhenitsyn was a pretty difficult guy, wasn't he? Yeah, well, Roger didn't have to deal with him personally, which was actually a good thing because once he actually came out of hiding, um, the Bodley had in was his British publisher and um, they had a meeting during which Solzhenitsyn, during their first meeting, had a list of 30 questions, and each question had uh, three or four sub-questions. And when he finished reading the first question, uh, 45 minutes had passed, and Max Reinhardt, the publisher of the Bodley Head, said, you are wrong on every count. Now, what's your next question? And the meeting took five hours. Uh, <laughs> so Roger, luckily, didn't have to deal with, deal with that side of his personality. <laughs> but there's this funny story in, in the book about some woman who uh, left uh, FSNG, went to uh, Old Reinhardt or somebody else, sent them back a note that saying, everybody here plays tennis. Tennis here is like sex at FSNG. Tennis is Which they're all about. <laughs> tennis is to Scribner, Scribner is as sex is to FSNG. Okay, okay. Having a lovely time here. Uh, yeah, well, she was one of the people who had uh, had a little something with Roger. Um, yeah, there was the idea that every house had its own culture, and the culture of FSG was sex. Um, Dorothea, Roger's wife, called it a sexual sewer. Um, How did she put up with that? Or did she have her own things on herself? She did, um, at least one. But uh, I think that she was actually in love with him, that guy. And, th and he died quite young. I don't know what would have come of it if he'd kept living. But um, uh, How old was he when he died? He was 51 or something. Arthur the Bradford. Her, 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 her paramour. Her, yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So they actually, it was only a two-year relationship. Or something. He was actually the guy who uh, redesigned the house to receive guests. So this is a, and which Roger probably knew about him. And this was, this was a de facto open relationship. But Dorothea suffered much more from it. Uh, she confided to her own son that she didn't have a second child because she was worried about um, not being attractive to mm. him anymore. I mean, it, it's just, it's a sad story, but. Uh, not by any means uncommon, I think, in that yeah. in that age. There were other problems too, weren't there, but between father and son, because yeah. uh, the son left. I think he came back. He left again. I, I, I don't recollect for sure, but 
Certainly he left at least once, I know that. His strength is in marketing, and he wanted more experience in marketing, and his father didn't respect marketing. He didn't understand what it was, you know. Publicity and marketing are not the same thing. Um, and so his son wanted to work somewhere where he could actually, um, I mean, they had different interests, but also Roger couldn't stand anyone else having any control. Yeah. So uh, he came back only because his father had cancer and thought it might be fatal and begged him to come back in the 80s. His father recovered and lived another 25 years. And um, they kept clashing. Um, and uh, eventually uh, his son left, and the year after was when he sold the company. Well, why, why did Strauss have so much trouble, apparently, keeping editors around? Uh, well, it was that control issue. Um, he didn't think that editors should um, consider themselves to be publishers. Um, and Giroux was okay with that. Uh, editors leave publishing houses all the time, but in order to have, I if you're a smaller house, you need to have some kind of stamp on your work. And uh, Giroux had provided that for 10 or 15, 20 years, and then he was the presiding intelligence after that, editorially. But um, the fact that you had Robbins leave, and then um, you had a couple of other editors leave after that, it, it started flailing because no one could stick around long enough. Um, and you could never command, you could never have that kind of push and pull relationship with anyone except for Giroux because they had met so early on in their lives. So in other words, it was uh, his way or the highway. Absolutely. And people wouldn't, uh, wouldn't abide that. As his secretary Peggy said, there's no politics at FSB. There's only one king, <laughs> <laughs> which yeah. I think is great. Yeah. yeah. But there were politics. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It was, it, was, it was called management by walking around. Yeah. And uh, why don't you explain that a little bit? I mean, we're, we're a small law school, so I do a lot of that, and so does the assistant dean. You know, we, we don't write a memo at the drop of the hat. We walk around, we see what people are doing, we <coughs> speak to them about it, about it, and so on and so forth. That's called management by walking around, but explain what, yeah. explain what he did. Well, you kind of described it, but, uh, it, you know, he would go to the um, bathroom in the morning and, uh, and in the evening, I'm sure probably a couple times in between, but he would do his walkabout every day. Um, especially That's a very Australian term. <laughs> right, sorry. I'm sure he wouldn't use that term. But uh, he would stop by everyone's office and say, what do you got for me? What's new today? And you had to have something to tell him. Um, or you'd fall out of favor, potentially. Um, it's not that you would get docked, docked or something. You know, it's just that you wanted to stay on his good Human side. Human nature. The, I, so it had to either be a piece of business or it had to be a really good story. And... Um, that was one way to do it. The other way was that they had circulating correspondence, which is great for a researcher 50 years later, looking through those archives and seeing every book they considered. Um, you'd have an editor weighing in with a brief comment and their initials, or just a note of amusement or something like that. I think it was really a way to keep the senior editors in the same circle, to make them feel like they were conduct. I mean, it's, you know, now you have email, so you can do that with group emails, but. Not the same. No. No, it's not the same thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. What were the changes, if any, at FSNZ after uh, Roger Strauss passed away? Jonathan, um, who's very smart, was surprisingly swift um, in the changes that he did make, but, but unsurprisingly, I guess, limited. He hired Sarah Crichton, who has more populist sensibilities. Um, he fired an editor-in-chief he didn't like very much. He um, brought on a... Um, CFO, which they'd never really had for real, um, to look over the finances to make sure that they were staying under budget. Um, and um, he rationalized it. Um, he swept away the termites is what he called it, you know. Um, you know, he did deferred maintenance. Um, so he, uh, in effect, he, uh, di he put it on what the average among us would call a more business-like basis. Yeah. It had been an art more artistic uh, under Roger Strauss, and now it became more, more business-like, so to speak. You had, for every book you acquired, you had to have a, uh, a P&L now. Well, thank you for coming up. I do appreciate it. Thanks for most having me. Most interesting you. book about a most interesting fellow and, and an industry which I'm always fond of uh, reading about and hearing about. So, again, thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And to the uh, audience, be with us again next time for the next edition of Books of Our Time. Thank you.